into what embodiment actually is and why is it so important? Yeah, I mean, normally the first question I get asked is what the hell is embodiment, right? <laughs> yeah, and of course. Um, I wish I had, a, I had a very quick answer. I mean, the very quick answer would be something like the subjective study of the body. So most people implicitly in our culture see the body as an object as a brain taxi, as a piece of meat that carries them around, but is not them. But actually implicitly, we also kind of get intuitively that we are in some ways our bodies. Like if you lost your phone, it's very different than losing your arm. I'd be upset about my phone, but I'm not losing a part of myself, right? Actually, phone might be a bad example because people tend to extend themselves into <laughs> it. Um, certainly any other object. So we're not, the body is not just a piece of meat, but it's part of who we are. It's part of how we think. It's part of how, you know, our social relations, uh, our psychology is not just in our head, it's in our whole being. Um, we could say embodiment is a form of intelligence. So things like bodily self-awareness, empathy, self-regulation, uh, impact and influence. These things are not theoretical. You can't just get them from a book. You have to get them through practice, through the body, into the body. Another way of looking at embodiment is like an umbrella term for all the arts that look at the body this way. So what do yoga, martial arts, comedy, improv, conscious dance, body therapy, you know, what do they have in common? Well, they all see that we develop the person through the body and they're all bodily in different ways. So it's kind of a long answer, but um, that covers some ground. But for anyone listening to this, I was thinking still, what would I get from it? I mean, obviously some of those things sound great. But if there was yeah. one thing that you would say, this is why you should, I don't like the word should, but you should be doing embodiment, it would be because of this. Yeah, your humanity and your sanity. Yeah. I mean, we live in a time, yeah, nothing, just a small thing. Um, we live in a time where most people are working with their minds, they're online a lot, technology, uh, not in nature, not in community, the things I was just talking about actually in the room. Uh, and because of that, we're cut off from ourselves. And what that leads to uh, is a whole bunch of problems. So everything from ill health uh, to stress related issues to difficulties in communication, connection, intimacy, relationship, you know, it really depends who they are, how I would answer that. You know, if they're a CEO in a company, they might be interested in leadership and you have to look at the body when you look at leadership. If they're, I don't know, young and dating and trying to get married, they might be interested in how attractive they are. And that is massively impacted by embodiment. Um, if they're suffering from illness, they would have a different way in. But basically, whatever problems we have, one of the best ways to solve them, it's not the only way, and in many cases, though, is the body because we can access the body. Like, if I tell you change your mind, that's quite difficult, but mm -hmm. you can change your posture or your breathing relatively easily. So it's, it's the access point to any of the issues we've got going on, and every issue we have going on is holistic meaning it involves the body as well as the mind and emotion. Mm. So when you, you raised an interesting point. So if, if anyone was here listening to this thinking, hang on a sec, you know, I'm in charge of staff. I, I manage people. Mm. I manage people. What would embodiment do for me as a leader? <laughs> okay. Hello, I'm Kevin, your new manager. I'm here to inspire you and lead you. Okay, so I'm slightly joking there. And if you can't yeah. see the video, if you're listening to the audio, if I you know don't express myself, that's not very helpful as a leader. Or imagine you're on a plane and the captain comes on. Hello, it's Kevin. Um, we've got a problem with the engine. I think we're going to be fine. Like that, that's not an embodiment that's going to engender trust. Mm. So in terms of inspiring people, building trust, uh, authority. You know, I used to work with groups of kids. I've worked with about 50,000 kids, actually. And they smell it if you don't have authority. And that's from the body. You can't say, um, hi, kids. Uh, can we do this, please, if that's okay? You just have to be firm, firm but kind. That's the embodiment kids respond to. But that's an embodiment. Firm but kind isn't just about the actions or the words. It's, it's how you do it. Embodiment's about how. So you can, you know, I've worked in fairly high-level business as a, as a trainer. And people come in with MBAs from Harvard and they're useless. They're rubbish. You know, they've been to Henley or Harvard or wherever, and they just don't have any charisma. They don't have any impact. But it's interesting, a lot of salespeople end up in high-end business because in sales, you have to learn embodiment. If you're doing sales, you have to learn it. And sometimes there's a phase people go through where it's a bit fake or a bit shallow, but a really good salesperson learns to empathize, learns to tune into other people, learns to express themselves authentically, 
you know, that, that kind of high end skills, that's all embodiment skills. Like a good comedian has those skills. A good parent has those skills. These are in some ways just the skills of competence, but you can really speed up the learning curve by kind of figuring out what they are and uh, learning them more effectively. So, and I think that you raise a really good point. I, I think the word embodiment, obviously people just focus on the physicality, but what you're describing just then was, you know, tone of voice and empathy and the way that we come across. Um, so that's just, can you just talk me a little bit about that and how that's embodiment when, you know, yeah, just yeah, for yeah. anyone listening, it's, it moves on from the physical. Let's break it down into skills. Mm. So it's really concrete. So when I work in business, we often use embodied intelligence as a model rather than any kind of philosophical stuff. Um, so first skill is self-awareness, right? Like I did a trauma thing just before we came on and I realized I was a little bit frazzled, right? So I just said, hey, Paul, before we hit record, we're going to have two minutes. And I went off, I changed my T-shirt, splashed water on my face, had a stretch, and I came back much better regulated. But I wouldn't have known I needed to do that were I not self-aware. Mm. Now, that self-awareness of the body, of my emotional state, my physical state, that comes through practice. That could come through meditation or yoga or whatever. But like a two-year-old doesn't have that. A two-year-old's like, I'm not tired. I don't need to go to bed. They just don't have the self-awareness. Or a drunk guy, you know, shouting on West Street on a Saturday night that he's not angry. He is angry. He just doesn't know it. He just doesn't have the self-awareness. So that's skill number one. Skill number two is what do we do about it? Can we self-regulate? Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, this is what a two-year-old doesn't have that we learn, but we can get even better at it that is common. So the you know, degree of self-regulation a martial arts master has or a yoga master has is very different than the average person. And I've had to learn that because I, I started off at quite a low starting point personally. So I had to kind of learn it a lot uh, myself. I'm at least average, I say now at that. Uh, and then empathy. Well, what is empathy? It's not just cognitive. I mean, a psychopath can kind of cognitively work out what's going on for you. But it's actually a resonance. This is why Zoom and, you know, we're on something like Zoom, right? And it's, it's so much better because I can see you and we can resonate. The mirror neurons can kick in like if somebody has trauma for example that can be dampened down so why hurt people sometimes hurt people not always but sometimes so empathy is a bodily skill it's about bodily sensitivity and receptivity and the same with charisma so you know tone of voice is just an expression of embodiment yeah okay it's like whether if my you know my voice is up here and i'm very nervous but that's just because i've got tension and i'm breathing it a certain way okay so tone of voice is just an easy way to illustrate it on a podcast but um uh, you know, that comes from one's embodiment. Um, you know, body language is well known, but it's a little bit deeper than body language because it's sometimes it's like I've had business people say, how do I seem trustworthy? And I'm like, be trustworthy, right? Yeah, like yeah. embody trustworthiness. Like don't just pretend. It's not It's not an affectation. It's not a you know, politician who's learned some weird gesture. You're actually working on your being and that exists on the level of state. So like, you know, I shifted my state before this interview. But it also exists on the level of trait. So if we sent you off to comedy improv every night for a year, you'd be different after that year. If we sent you off to Japanese martial arts training, you'd be different in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we build those different muscles through different practices. I think that's such a great answer. I think I really close it up because it, it, it's there's such a confusion over what is actually embodiment. And there's this, you know, when I was talking to people about, oh yeah, I was interviewing you today. You know, there's this. Oh, what, what movement is he talking about movement? Is he, what's he doing? And I, I know well, that's part of it, but we're going to be looking at this and I want to help people understand what embodiment really is and why it's really important. As in, you know, for leaders, for it's someone who's... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Um, it's okay. Didn't the line. <laughs> uh, well, I warn people that you're going to be, you might even be controversial on this episode. I don't know. Um, yeah, we've had some conversations yeah. where... <laughs> Right. Where um, even on your on your channels and things like that, uh, I know that you in, invite some uh, some good topics. Yeah. You invite some good discussions. Uh, but going it's back, to, you mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not scared of controversy, and I think if we're gonna mm. talk real talk, we need to yeah. not be afraid to express what we're actually thinking. And what I'd actually, well, I was going to go back to how you got to here, but as you just brought this up, uh, well, I kind of brought it up and. We're going, we're going further with this is 
what do you think is happening at the moment in a way that there seems to be a cancellation of people express themselves, um, which is creating quite a debate either side. Uh, there's a lot of polarity around this. What's your thoughts around, you know, not being able to express yourself at the moment without uh, some form of consequence, which can be quite damaging as well. It's, yeah. yeah. A punishment and censorship are the words you're looking for, I think. Mm. Um, so I was having lunch with someone today and I was very aware. We were having a conversation and we were saying things that were would have 10 years ago been in no way controversial, very center of the road things. So these weren't like extremist points of view and certainly nothing that 10 years ago would have anyone would have batted an eyelid about. And as the waitress came along, we both stopped talking because we didn't want to be overheard. And you remember when you were young, if, if you had like, you know, that one racist friend who would like look over his shoulder before saying something terrible. Now it's not just a crazy racist friend. It's most people. It's most of the population. Mm. Um, so I think unfortunately what's happened is a, an increase in a certain kind of weaponized sensitivity. Uh, there's a particular ideology that's come in, which... It's essentially a substitute religion. So I'm getting this from Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, who's an American academic in this area. Um, we live in a culture that really has lost the sense of meaning, of values, of spirituality. And what replaces that is sort of nihilism, narcissism, and hedonism. But those things don't really cut it. I mean, you live in Brighton, right? You know, you, you know these things. Mm. And that's one reason I moved out of Brighton is it's the center of those kind of things. And nihilism narcissism and hedonism they get you through the day but they're not great so people are really seeking a way to be good and in declining civilizations when we're in one instead of virtue being established through actions it's established through words and etiquette and sort of performative language so why for example is um person of color good and and colored person bad now, that, that's really a, a very sl slight distinction. Really, it's just the reverse order of the exact same words, right? And I don't have really a strong opinion on that. I'm sure maybe historically we could look at where it comes from and someone will be much more informed than me. But what essentially we have now is a sort of priestly caste of academics who teach this etiquette and the rest of us have to follow it. And I think it's crazy making. Uh, and people can't, it's a disconnection from actual reality for social reality, which again is a sign of decadence and the fall of an empire. Um, so I think we live in that time. And, you know, like in Ukraine, it doesn't exist, right? When I'm working in Ukraine, no one cares about pronouns. You know, the people are getting raped and killed and stuff. They've got, they've got, they've, they've got first, you know, different problems, not first world problems. Um, so I think it's also a sign that we can, can we have enough, uh, we have enough, uh, luck to be able to worry about such things so i think there's a few things going on with it but it's it's certainly crazy making and I, what i see is a lot of mentally ill youth I, I see a lot of young people who are really unhappy and the drug addiction rates and suicide rates and mental illness rates are skyrocketing in a generation that have taken this on so it, it doesn't seem to be really um making anyone happy even the people who are pushing it most like i've I've met the most extreme activists in Brighton of this kind of thing, you know, at Sussex University. It's mm. for listeners in America, that's like the Berkeley of England. Um, and then none of them are happy because they're miserable. So I say some, something, you know, we do need to speak out about this. Yeah. And what do you think the, I mean, obviously you talked about the youth and the, you know, the mental health challenges that they're facing. Sure. What impact is does it have on someone if they're not able to express themselves? What happens there? Yeah, you know this as a psychologist, Paul. I mean, we, we need to think out loud. So to think out loud, we need to talk to each other. We need to disagree. We need to get it wrong without being cancelled. We need to be clumsy. You know, we think out loud. That's what conversation yeah. is. And words die so that people don't, right? So it's a phrase. I forget where I got it from, from someone else. And... Um, we need to be able to have conversations to work things out, even to be clumsy at times. And to police that too strictly is a problem. Um, also, it also gets in the way of real virtue. Like there's a whole generation who are arguing about nonsense instead of actually making scientific discoveries and creating great art and going into politics. So they're just arguing about nonsense. And you can burn so much energy on the internet. And I used to um, you know, arguing about this stuff. 
And it's just a distraction. And, you know, in the meantime, the rich are still getting richer, right? I mean, the one kind of privilege no one discusses is the only kind that matters. If you look at the ruling party of the UK, the Conservative Party, they've got people of every colour in their ruling cabinet. But, but they're all wealthy. They're all millionaires. Mm -hmm. yeah. They all went to Eton. Mm -hmm. okay? So it doesn't matter if they're gay or black or brown. It matters that they're rich. That's what matters. And everything else is a distraction. In some ways, I'm like an old school leftist, you know. So um, I, I've got a lot, of, a lot more sympathy for sort of trade union leftists than I have for mm -hmm. the, the woke brigade, because at least they're trying to get us holidays and weekends and workers' rights and things, you know. No, I think that's it has some really, really interesting points. And I, I think the, the stress, the, the level of pressure on someone for being shamed and the, you know, the level of anxiety of not knowing what to say anymore is what's creating such a polarity. I think there is an element of, of people fighting back against it, and therefore we get this battle, which the only the only people that win from that are the lovely media sites, the social media sites that get to host it. They're like, yay. Well, that's the other laugh? thing. Yeah. Technolog yeah. It's technologically mediated for profit. Like I wrote something really balanced on Facebook today that had a left and a right point of view that was not attacking anyone, and it got three likes because Facebook didn't promote it. Now I can write something controversial and stir shit and it will get a hundred likes. I mean, the platform is encouraging mental ill health. It's encouraging, you know, what Buddhists would call the three poisons. Yeah. Kind of like greeting, ignorance and attachment. Um, so we're in a for profit corporate led uh, drive towards insanity. And, and, and the, the political side of things is impacted by that. And we're just playing catch up with that. We're just playing catch up with this technology that's been introduced uh, that, that brings out the worst in human nature. But here's the thing, Paul. I would say, like, if you go out to the pub down the road, like, me and you have quite different politics in some ways, but we can have a drink together. Like, mm. we can be on a podcast together. Like, most people are all right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, most people get on fine. So uh, I think this stuff can be overstated because there's a, a small, traumatized, mentally ill minority who are very vocal. And that leads to an unhealthy backlash on the other side. Like one of the things we really have to be careful of right now is a far right youth movement of young white men being pissed off mm. and they can't get laid because of what Tinder's done. And they've got no jobs because the economy's rubbish and they haven't moved out of house because they, you know, the economics of England mean they can't buy a house anymore. So they live with their parents and they're pissed off. And that's, that's the birth of far right movements. And we do not want that. Well, no, that's when people like Andrew Tate, isn't it? They begin to hoover them up. With, the, with their ideologies and what it was like to be a real man. Um, and these guys just become lonelier and lonelier, and more isolated. It, it be, it's, again, these people profit from other people's misery, but we're, we are heading in that, in that direction. But I'm an eternal optimist. I believe that we all come to these points because at some point in time, it'll all come crashing down. And from that, something beautiful will be born. That's what I think anyway. I think that's what I think. I, I see well, civilization die at every form. The, the problem is if this civilization dies, the next biggest one's the Chinese and they harvest organs and millions of people and have concentration camps. Mm. So it's like, if people say they hate Western civilization, I'd say, great. What's the alternative? Cause right now it's China, the Arab world. I mean, you wouldn't do very well in most of the Arab world as a gay man, right? No. Um, India, if we're lucky, that's probably our best hope for the future. Um, so I say the West is a magnificent civilization, the likes of which humanity has never produced. And I love Western civilization. Mm. And I really don't want to see it die so it can so something else can be reborn. Uh, yeah. It definitely needs an upgrade though at this point. <laughs> yeah, I think I, there's always room for it. I think that upgrade is a really good word. I think I think things come crashing down for us to improve, and what we're witnessing in a minute yeah. is, especially with um, the way that you know we're in the what they call the fourth turning point. Um, you know, it's we are moving towards another change, a big change. And I think social media has changed that. We've got AI on the way, you know, which is, I say, on the way, but having such a huge impact on us all together. Yeah, and we can't get away from the, just the back to the topic of maybe I'm qualified to speak about, you know, this stuff on policies, I don't even know if I'm qualified, but certainly on the body, you know, we, we've got to stay anchored in the body as a sane point, a reality point. We can't just identify as attack helicopters. We do need to have the sanity of the body as an anchor, you know, rather than spending all our time in on online in the metaverse, the body will keep people sane, anchoring that, you know, I see you walking along the seafront when I used to live there, get a bit of exercise, a bit of fresh air, yeah. you know, do a bit of yoga. It doesn't have to be rocket science. And, it, and 
I think it has gone from a a luxury to a necessity in the modern age to do some kind of embodied practice. Like that's the, why do you think pe- the main change. I yeah, why do you think people are resistant to that? What's what resistance do you hear about for you know when you talk about embodiment? It's it's very important, but there are you know like my work, I can talk about you know the basics, but yeah, it's amazing how many people don't want to get the basics right. They they think that they can somehow hack their way past them. But they're, they're in my office. Yeah. They're, in my, they're in my office. They're, in your they're office, obviously yeah. sick. Yeah. yeah, I mean, on the one hand, I'd say I've seen resistance get less and less. I mean, 20, what is it, 20, 25 years ago when I first did corporate work, mindfulness was like some weird hippie thing, you know? Mm. And then John kabat came in, emotional intelligence, mindfulness, yoga's been huge, in, you know, in, in my adult life. You know, that was just something my hippie mum did when I was a kid. And now it's just on every street corner. And everyone's got a mindfulness app. And it might be a shallow approach. It might be a MOOC mindfulness app, but it's there. And so I, th- I think resistance generally has got less and less. So I, like, I mean, even like working in Ukraine, like like they're they're open to trauma awareness. Now, you know, the British or American military 20, 30 years ago, pff, just total denial, mm. total denial. Ukrainian military now really clued in, really clued in. So um, I do see a lot of signs of hope. Uh, and again, we're we're in an economic system that encourages greed and disconnection. Uh, we're in a, you know, we're in a sort of for-profit tech system, which is making us crazy. Um, we live in ways that our ancestors would have regarded as appalling. We are disconnected from community, disconnected from land. Um, it's amazing that that everybody is not like floridly schizophrenic. I think we're hanging in there as best we can by our fingernails and, you know, people do their best. And sometimes it's just for people, they're just hanging in there with their coping mechanisms of drinking eight cans of beer every night, like I used to, you know, back in the day. And they don't really want to be told that anything else is possible. But on the whole, I'm like you, actually, I'm, I'm, it might sound grumpy, but I'm actually pretty hopeful. I do see my job's got easier and easier over the years. Well, um, how did you get to, you mentioned Ukraine, how, and I saw what you were doing online, which is, it looked phenomenal. How did you, what, you know, how did you get into that and what happened for you? Uh, well, my wife's Ukrainian, so I, I met her, she was one of my interpreters in the first part of the war. So the war, the invasion now is a continuity of a, a smaller war, effectively eight years ago when the Russians first invaded part of Ukraine. Um, and I was asked to come do a trauma workshop because I was, you know, my day job is training coaches, right? I train embodiment coaches and I was training some in Ukraine. They said, hey, a war's broken out. Can you do some trauma work? Because they had very little trauma awareness at that time in Ukraine. I said, sure. Didn't have, you know, they didn't have much money, but I was like, why not? This is a good thing. Uh, so they uh, brought me over for training. Uh, I was looking for a wife at the time. They introduced me to a phenomenal number of strong, wise, sexy women of roughly the right age. Um, one of them I married. Um, so that when the, the second part of the war happened last year, um, I was just very connected to the psychologist community in Ukraine, and uh, I just wanted to do something positive. Uh, so we delivered some medical supplies to a children's hospital, raised some money for that, and um, I started a trauma awareness charity in Ukraine. So uh, I trained a couple of hundred people who have since trained over 100,000 people in um, what's called trauma first aid and basic trauma education. Um, so to become a therapist takes years, but to give people the basics of trauma education, which goes a long way, uh, that can be done relatively quickly. So um, working with local psychologists, and it's now a, a charity called Sane Ukraine, and it's uh, run by local women out of Lviv in the west of Ukraine. And um, most days I'm in contact with my girls, as I call them, though they are you know, 25 year old women. And um, they send me terribly worrying messages most days, and I try and provide some psychological supervision and help mm-hmm. and advice. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal what you're doing and, um, you know, the impact that it's actually having. Uh, what was it like for you when you were there? Because I, I saw that you were there when it was uh, quite early on when it was actually happening. What was it like for you? Weeks. It's pretty intense. Um, I mean, it's one of the most meaningful and enjoyable things I've ever done. When I say enjoyable, though, I don't mean like fun, fun. I mean, deeply satisfying. I mean, it's pretty disturbing, you know, to see the refugees people keep shooting at us which was annoying like trying to do a training and the air alarms kept going off we kept having to move the training to the bomb shelter so a lot of the training got done in the car park the underground car park okay. um very intense very meaningful stressful at times um got covid when i was there 
you know, it's beautiful working with cool people, working with a local convent of nuns. They were helping out, saw terrible things, saw beautiful things. Um, you know, you grew up quick doing it. Like my assistants were just young ladies from the local psychology university who were just about to graduate from their MAs. And I, in a year, I've seen them go from being sort of selfie Instagram 24 year olds to like, really mature sophisticated strong wise 25 year olds like you know they're hearing horror stories on a daily basis horror stories things i won't even repeat on the podcast and um you know they're doing intense work and they're very they're very heroic and they just want to help the country and hopefully i've given them something that can be useful and they seem to be spreading it which is which is good but um it's kind of an adventure in some ways but not necessarily what i'd recommend i mean i got fairly burnt out from it at one point last year and had to sort of step back before stepping forwards again and what would i mean obviously it sounds like you've been through quite a lot and what would you do embodiment wise to look after you yeah i mean in ukraine or now uh, well both i mean what would what did you do to help yourself manage that in ukraine and what would you do here <laughs> Yes. Uh, so in Ukraine, for example, I was using TRE, which is a shaking technique. Um, some of my colleagues at EMDR specialists, which is another technique I recommend. Uh, we use a tapping technique, like an EFT type tacking, tapping technique. Uh, lots of nature. I used to go to the gym. I used to sometimes leave the, uh, one of the other psychologists in charge and go lift weights. You know, it can be very simple to burn off that fight or flight. A lot of co-regulation. So, you know, like we'd have a day off and go to the sauna by the lake and, you know, imagine just like hanging out with all these cool people in the sauna with the trees, swimming in the lake and then military attack helicopters on a rocket run comes past the lake and you go, whoa, but, you know, you try your best to kind of like call eco-regulate. Um, lots of, you know, meaning and purpose is really important. And that's what people lack really in the West. That's why, you know, the West is fast. But I never lacked that there. I have my own, we did a lot of meditation every day. We did an hour of meditation and movement just to regulate everyone's just to regulate the team. So before we did any sort of training about trauma, we do, you know, meta meditation, we do some yoga, we did some play stuff, you know, all sorts yeah. of breath work. I mean, I'm pretty well equipped. So um, both for myself, the team and the participants, we did a lot of different somatic practices. Uh, and then when you get home, there's a, like, I've got a whole ritual, you know, there's things I do. Uh, to decompress they call it um okay. and to release afterwards and to sort of get back into you know sometimes that's the hardest part is just going to tesco's afterwards you know it's like life life has an intensity in a war zone which is um not the case you know in rural england or whatever yeah yeah so what would be a, a what would be an element of your ritual that you practice here that maybe something that someone listening to this could do themselves yeah, well, it can be simply something as simple as having a shower, right? You know, it can be a kind of cleansing ritual. For some people, it might be swimming in the ocean in Brighton. It's very pagan in a way, you know, a water cleansing. Uh, I used yeah. to go dancing. There's an old church in Brighton where they have conscious dance. And there's a little military uh, um, a shrine almost in the church. And for hundreds of years, soldiers have been going to war zones and coming back and giving thanks. And I used to dance in that church and sort of sit at that part of the church and you know, the dancing was part of the letting go as well. Um, yeah, there's other other little things, you know, put your flak jacket deep into your cupboard away from your normal clothes. So um, there's a few things. But uh, yeah, the dancing at that church was always part of my ritual in Brighton because it was, um, you know, I've been dancing in that church for 10 years. So it's got a sort of uh, mm. symbolic, ritualistic kind of weight to me. Mm. Nice. And could you have imagined, I mean, you had to be mentioned at the beginning of the interview, that there are some low points that have happened in your life and just listening to where you are now, Mark, and seeing what you're achieving it is pretty phenomenal. I know you've had your, you know, your challenges and you're very open and very, and you, you know, you express your vulnerability on online about that. Um, what got you? What, where did, how did it begin for you to, to become, where, you know, to start in, to becoming an embodiment a uh, coach, you know, an author, you're a podcaster, you know, it's, you've done some incredible work. How did it start? Yeah, I mean, any success comes from three things, luck, hard work and talent, right? So there's a degree of luck for sure. Like our biggest conference, the embodiment conference happened in the middle of COVID. So that, you know, was lucky for us in a way, you know, um, I think I was, you know, I came from an alcoholic family. So that was, you know, I've been open about this elsewhere. I'm in sobriety myself now for some years. 
and that kind of formed me in a certain way that was bad but also gave me certain superpowers yeah just like not giving a fuck so mm. like even our trauma can give us superpowers that are good that can form us to have unusual life i was very lucky to found aikido and martial arts really gave me a lot of the sort of spine and discipline there's no way i would have been able to do ukraine without what martial arts gave me you know that, that gave me a level of discipline and ability to handle pressure that just is is not normal in the in the western world um so i was very lucky to find that but then equally i was very hard working at that i dedicated myself to it i mean i've i've really just followed a sense of purpose my whole life and not cared that much about anything else like you know sometimes i sometimes i'm rich sometimes i'm poor you know i've been up and down you know i think i'm in i'm in the front of economy class at the moment. I, will, I judge it by airplanes. I've been in first class, business class, the back of economy. Now I'm kind of like economy plus, I think, you know? Oh. Um, so I've been up and down. It doesn't really bother me because I'm, I'm just doing what I love. And I just yeah. keep following what I love and applying myself through it. Hopefully with some, you know, my main talent really is teaching, actually. I love teaching. Um, yeah. And I'm from a family of teachers. So I guess I'm standing on those shoulders. I'm a third generation teacher. Um, so there are a few factors as to some luck, some hard work, some basic talent for teaching, maybe. Um, I don't know how we can break these down. The problem with asking for anyone successful is you're not talking to the nine people who weren't successful, right? So um, yeah, but I wonder of, what drives you. Accurate. I mean, it's something drove you to, I mean, you didn't just become a maths teacher. You, you've ended up doing something, you know, where you're traveling to war zones. You founded a charity. Uh, you're author of t uh, two books, or is it three books? Three books, uh, no, yeah, three. Yeah. Yeah, three, three books. So you're on a roll. Um, there's, so, there's so much that you're, so you're not following a default path here. I wonder what drives you to get you to where you are now. Yeah, I mean, everyone's sure. driven by their neurotic trauma patterns, you know, basically. Yeah. But but also, so that's one thing. Um, but also, it's like, well, what else is there other than meaning and purpose? What what else is there? Like, I tried hedonism, and it just led to me being a drug addict, alcoholic. Mm. Like, I fucked my way through Moscow. It was great, but ultimately, like, yeah, you know, mm. fucked my way through Sao Paulo. I fucking drunk my way through Ireland and England. But you know, I've. It's, what other game is there? I mean, kill yourself or get busy. It, it's like I don't get why everybody else isn't living a life of purpose. It's not like I wake up and smack the world in the face with my giant cock or something, right? Like, it's like mostly I wake up and go, I'm kind of tired. I need a coffee and I don't really want to have a cold shower, but I'll have one anyway because <laughs> I know it's good for me. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I'm not that yeah. different than most people. And I still have lazy days and it's not like I'm so mega productive. You know, I sit on the beach, I sit in the woods, I play with my niece and nephew. And it's, um, I just sort of go like, like, what else are you doing other than what you love? Like, why would you bother? Like, I'm confused by the lack of purpose in most people. I, I think they need explaining, not me. Like, I'm logical. You know, well, I think, I think you raised some really amazing points there about, you know, have a purpose you know do that or, or you know do the busy side of things um or do something else uh but it is just what's driving people mad and i think people struggle with purpose because they have this overarching idea it's supposed to be something absolutely huge it doesn't have to be does it not really no i mean 50 percent of my female friends they discovered their life purpose was having kids and being great mums, and not necessarily the ones i would have expected you know, for some people, they're just yeah. natural born gardeners. They should throw themselves into that. You don't have to be going to, you know, I'm just a sort of extrovert, dramatic, show off kind of a guy, right? So my projects are going to look a certain way. I'm a kind of yang kind of person. For other people, they're just really nurturing, you know, like one of my colleagues is having twins right now. And I, I know nobody better to have twins than her. And they, she's such <laughs> going to be such a gift to them as a mother. So, like, we should honor that absolutely equally um we're all got different personalities right like my personality i'm naturally brave to the point of being stupid right so obviously you know delivering also like i used to be a drug dealer right so me and my mate who both used to be drug dealers we were smuggling medicines for kids across the border in ukraine and like we were just in our element we're like playing music <laughs> okay. as we try and because it's pretty illegal what we did and like we broke all sorts of codes about medicines and all sorts and we but for us we're just having fun it's we're in our element you know and there's somebody else who's looking after elderly refugees in ukraine i couldn't do that it's not for me but credit to them 
you know what I mean? Like we've all got to yeah. apply our talents in the way we have, and it doesn't make anyone better than anyone else. But I just think it's sad if people don't apply any talents and, you know, I just don't see the point. So for me, it's like, I'd, I'd rather be doing this than working in Tesco's or whatever, you know, it's for me, it's, it's what I love. But I mean, besides some of the things we may have mentioned already, but why, why do you think people are struggling to find their purpose right now? What's happening? Distraction. So we, we are, we are enmeshed in a system of distraction. Like, you know what, as soon as we're off this call, I'll probably be on this, this devil box, you know? And it's like this yeah. iPhone is set up to take my attention and attention is the most precious thing there is. So it's like, I'm glad that I found my purpose before I was enmeshed in that technology world. I think that's, that's one thing hmm. we're not, in a, in a consumerist world we're we're taught that uh what is the answer is stuff you just need to get richer and get more stuff um and there's versions of that like you just gotta like pull more girls or just gotta like have more exotic holidays in bali that's all materialism just through other forms right you know you've got a external appearance is what matters it's all about the selfies and all about the everyone loving you on instagram looking good on the beach you know so if you're interested in how you look you're interested in acquiring more and more of course you won't find purpose you know go off into the woods for a month in a tent bring a loaf of bread with you so you don't starve you can live off a loaf of bread for a week you know sit there for a week or two in a tent in the woods then tell me you haven't got your life purpose like this is what you need to do you need to you need to suffer a little bit i also think people just don't sit in silence they're terrified you know it's yeah. uh I've, I've, I've released a few meditations on i've got another channel called another level <laughs> where i do more experiment uh, more experimental stuff and it's, well, it's, it's, it's experimental there's meditations where i encourage people just to sit in silence <laughs> um they're not you know there's lots of other stuff but but actually people mention on the on that channel they, uh, it's really difficult you know, because the ego goes crazy, the mind goes crazy, and yeah. people get overwhelmed with the feelings of that. So there is a an overwhelm happening within the body. So they're quickly to move out of that. They don't want that feeling of boredom or panic, or even well, to not, hear what they may have to, to really say about themselves. We're used to constant entertainment, mm. and that drowns out the kind of still quiet voice of our body and let that is the radar that something is needed now there's a new project i'm really interested in and it lights me up right and i told my wife about it over dinner two nights ago i said do you think i should do this i don't think there's much money in it and it might alienate my market and she looked at me and just immediately went yep and i said why did you say yes so quick she's like because i know you i can already see that you're decided to do it i can already see that it's lighting you up and i know you're gonna do it so i might as well support you and I was like, I just laughed. I was like, well, you know me well, because I had already sort of decided. I was just looking for someone that I love to give me permission, you know? Yeah, and it's yeah. like, I'm pretty in touch with that feeling. But if you're not, if you, your life is noise, you'll never hear it. For me, it's just a little 1% adjustment now. You know, when I was young, it was a real, real difficult thing. I had to really mm -hmm. suffer and spend a lot of time kind of quieting my mind and being in nature and before I could hear, and it's not all or nothing, you know. Like I'd say to anyone listening, if you're if you're feeling off purpose, just of the things in your life, which feels a bit more right, which feels a bit closer, you know. Like I used to work with kids because I, I love working with kids, and I was but what I was really drawn to was teaching. And then I realized it's not really about kids; it's the teaching. And I went, it's not really about teaching; it's about teaching embodiment. Okay, it's not really about. So, so you can always mm. get closer to it. You don't have yeah. to have a you hear these stories on podcasts and someone's got a cool project or maybe they're Olympic athlete or they're a Navy SEAL. And it's very specific and very extreme. You know, most of us won't ever be David Goggins. Do you know what I mean? Like most of us aren't that intense. Even me. Yeah. I'm like, listen to David Goggins. I'm like, oh my God, you know? So it's like, no, I don't feel guilty about getting up at seven and not five in the morning, you know? Um, but instead, just kind of like quiet yourself a little bit, move your body a little bit more. You know, I'm going dancing for two hours tonight. I know I'll have my best ideas after I go dancing. I know I will. That's where my best ideas will come for my business, for whatever. Is so just do a little bit more to get anybody. Is that because you, you go into, uh, you know, that's an intentional flow state, isn't it? And for me, flow states, yeah. when I you're access a flow state, I get my best stuff. For sure. You're a genius when you're in that state. And I get it. You know, you know what? I'm going to use my psychic powers, Paul, right? Everyone listening to this in the future... Mm -hmm. I want you to think of where you have your best ideas, right? Everyone got it in their head. 
I'm going to mind read you. One third of you are thinking on the toilet. One third of you are on the sh- in the shower or in the bath. And one third it's in nature. And just a few of you will be something else. So most of you listening to this will be one of those three places. Why? Because you're relaxed and you're in your body. Okay, when you're in nature, when you're having a shower, even when you go to the toilet, even just relaxing your body helps. And then something that gives you a full trance state, like drumming or dancing or whatever, that's even more gonna gonna help. But even just normal people, they're always like, my best idea is in the shower. I'm like, really, no mobile phone, feeling your body all over and relaxing. Who would have thought it? Oh, and it's a pagan (laughs) cleansing ritual at the same time as well. Yeah, no, I I absolutely agree with you. I get uh, when I go skiing or when I go running. Anything to do with exercise for me, um, that's when I um, I feel very embodied, but also at the same time, that's when I get some of my best ideas. And it's it's free sure. and accessible. This is the thing about it. Embodiment doesn't have to cost. I mean, you know, you can come to one of our workshops and, you know, we're doing one in Slovenia. It's beautiful. Pay a lot of money, fly there. It's great. But you can just, I used to swim in the sea in Brighton when I had no money. And I tell you, that was a hell of a practice on a cold day in October, yeah, swimming yeah, yeah. in the sea. Woo! extreme yeah. or if you know you want something a bit gentler these days i just walk in the woods it doesn't have to be expensive <laughs> or extreme um mark where can people find more about your work yeah grinder uh, is the best way to if only paul if only uh no not grinder so if you put the word embodiment into the internet i come up so there's a book uh, several books on amazon put embodiment uh there's a podcast the embodiment podcast 500 episodes uh the probably the main place though is the app or the website we have an app and the website and it's embodiment unlimited so it's the embodiment app or embodimentunlimited.com and on there there's loads of free stuff so my first book's actually free as a pdf on there uh there's videos of some of the top world's top embodiment teachers there's demos of coaching sessions for people who are coaches so lo- like re- like the app and the website just loads of free stuff uh lastly if you want to ask me a question the best place is actually instagram um so okay. if you ping me yeah, a question, I, as long as it's short i will answer yeah, yeah your instagram is gold you know you, I, I like how you're very short there's sometimes a bit of controversy but some of the points that you raise i can see from people commenting uh because you could tell people are reading it and going no he can't believe he's just said that <laughs> and then then you make that little point at the end and then people are like oh okay now i get it and then yeah, you know i can see the comments yeah. coming in <laughs> Well, sort of some of my job in life, it's kind of my karma is to say the things other people are thinking and don't dare say, um, Mm. or to sort of bring balance and force. So like, you know, my conservative friends, I I kind of try and help them understand the kind of more liberal way of looking at life and vice versa. Um, You know, for me, it's all about balance. And um, yeah, I kind of have fun with it as well. Some of the the personal growth stuff just takes itself way too seriously, Paul. And my sort of Anglo-Irish background is just like much more like having a good time having laughs i mean some yeah. of the stuff in yoga meditation really we need to poke fun at it so um <laughs> let's not take ourselves just just because there's war and famine and disaster doesn't mean we should take things seriously uh mark it's been an absolute pleasure lovely to see you thanks for this interview it's been a long time coming um so yeah, nice finally did it. Up. Nice. good interview man nice nice listening skills appreciate it <laughs>